for the spring edition of Upstate Cocktails with a Curator. I noticed that Jeff McCullough popped in earlier. He's one of the librarians at Berman Library, and this was his idea in the fall. And we have him to thank for coming up with the idea, for copying the Frick Museum and making our own and making a very successful series. And it was so good that um, Martha Severins, our speaker tonight, actually contacted me and said, I think we should do this again. And she helped pull it together for, the, for April. So we are thrilled um, that it went so well, that you all enjoyed it, and that we're able to offer it again um, for this month. So we have Martha tonight, and then um, Tom Strange, with a musical instrument next week. And then the third week is Furman's First Gentleman talking about renovations at the president's home. And then we're working on the fourth week. So stay tuned for that, but it's, it's gonna be great. Um, as, as I said, we're recording, we've got everybody spotlighted, so you don't need to do anything with your view. It's all ready to go. I want to thank Martha Severance for being with us tonight. Many of you know her from different ways. She is an Ollie member. She's an Ollie instructor. She's an Ollie hiker, um, and she's also the for a former curator at the Greenville County Museum of Art. So she is here with that hat on tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to Martha. Thank you, Nancy. I also want to thank Mary McCarthy, who was a colleague of mine at the Greenville County Museum of Art, and she has helped me uh, for hours over the technology of all of this. So if things go wrong, you can blame either one of them, okay? Okay, so this is called Cocktails with a Curator and you have been instructed to grab a pencil and paper so we can decode a masterpiece. We're going to look at symbols and I think everybody should be able to come up with a, 12, a 10. I think many of you should be able to come up with about 15. And some of you who are really sharp and clever, and maybe if you extend the definition of symbol, uh, you might come up with 20 different options. So here's the painting. I'm not going to tell you who painted it at this point or what the title is. I will tell you it belongs to the Greenville County Museum of Art. It was a gift to, me, to the museum uh, about 1995. It's a large painting. It's 50 inches high by 70 inches wide. And what you're not seeing is a very handsome, and I can tell you from personal experience, a very heavy frame. So now I hope you've written down a few symbols. I'll give you another minute or 30 seconds or so to digest this painting. Look at all the details. Ready, set, go. I'm going to start in the middle. I'm going to start with a prominent figure. She's wearing a flag, and I'm sure you all recognize it as the American flag. I have tried on numerous occasions to count the number of stars on the flag, but I have not been successful. However, if I was successful, the flag might look something like this, uh, a flag from about 1855. If we look at that central figure again, she's wearing this rather curious red hat with a border of little gold stars. The red hat is known as a liberty cap or a phrygian cap. I think liberty might make sense to you. Um, and also phrygian. I have another example of liberty. This is Eugene Delacroix's famous painting of Liberty Leading the People from 1830. The natural thing to think is that this has to do with the French Revolution. Actually, it's a more contemporary event from 1830 when uh, King Charles uh, was removed from the throne. 
but the key element that I want you to look at is what the lead figure is wearing on her hat on her head and that's called a liberty cap. The liberty cap became particularly popular in France during the French Revolution but it dates back to ancient times to a country that's obscurely known as Phrygia, now part of modern Turkey, uh, where uh, it was worn and uh, identified also with uh, personal freedom. The cap has become very much a symbol of France uh, and for countless years it has appeared over and over again on the French stamp. And that's why I've, I've included uh, the figure of Marianne, as uh, she is known uh, there on the stamp. So we have two things that might identify the central figure uh, as maybe, what do you want to say, America or liberty? If you look at the lower portion of the painting, there's this great cornucopia uh, near her feet. Uh, this country was, of course, always associated with being uh, a very fertile land, and cornucopia has often been used as a symbol of thanksgiving. The fourth thing that might help to identify this woman as liberty and or America is what she's holding in her left hand, a rather odd looking object, a weapon of sorts perhaps. Uh, it actually dates back to Roman times. It consists of a bundle of rods that are tied together and then this weapon is placed on, at the top. It's known as a fascia or facies and what it means, uh, symbolizes, is e pluribus unum. And of course, that's a phrase that I think you recognize out of, out of many. One, it's a phrase that appears on uh, our currency. You can also see it in the sculpture of Lincoln, in the Lincoln Memorial, uh, that was carved by Daniel Chester French. And you'll see that symbol over and over again. Okay, so you should be all set with that central figure. Let's move off to the woman on the left-hand side of the painting. I'd like to look first at the background where we see nearest to her these leafy greens that appear to be tobacco plants. Behind them are a number of uh, dark-skinned workers in the field. Uh, and I think if you look closely, you can see that the field is a field of cotton. And the tree that they are under, under, standing under is a peach tree. So there we have three, four symbols all there in the background. You'll notice also that that cornucopia that I was talking about a minute ago is slanted more towards this figure. This figure, if you look at her, she is a, what I would call décolletage. Her garment has fallen off her shoulder. Uh, it might indicate that she's hot, that she lives in a hot climate. Uh, and uh, if you notice, she's kind of listlessly leaning her left arm on what is a bale of cotton. Okay, I think you're probably getting the idea here that this is a personification of the South. Now let's look again at that bale of cotton. There are two letters, a slash mark, and two numbers. This actually consists uh, of, the, of the signature for our painter. Our painter's name was Luther Terry, L.T., as you see on the bale of cotton. He was born in Enfield, Connecticut in 1813. Interestingly enough, Enfield, Connecticut was a mill town uh, and also produced ammunition. Uh, that was used in the Civil War. He died in Rome 
in 1900, and he'd been a painter there beginning in 1839. The numbers with the slash mark before them uh, are a signal that this painting was done in 1858. So all told, we have on the left-hand side of the painting a representation of the South, the artist's signature on that bale of cotton that she is leaning on. And of course, in the center, America. Now let's turn to the woman on the right-hand side of the painting. Who is she? Well, first of all, if you look at what she's wearing, she's uh, a little more prim. Uh, she's not losing her garment. She has several layers on, as if perhaps it is a cooler climate. She is pointing to a book that has a uh, a bold title. It's called The Useful Arts and Sciences. I'm not quite sure you can see that, but certainly the book represents education, uh, knowledge. Another thing that might represent knowledge is the tree that she is sitting under. That's an oak tree. An oak tree usually represents knowledge, uh, resilience, um, authority. And interestingly, apropos of our artist, a, nat a native of Connecticut, uh, there was such a thing as the Charter Oak, which was uh, the under which the charter was signed that allowed Connecticut to govern itself. So this is back um, when England turned over the rights uh, or freed Connecticut to govern itself. Now let's look in her background, and we'll see a white church with a white steeple uh, nestled in this hilly landscape. And uh, closer in the foreground, near the river, uh, looks like some mill structures, some brick mill structures. And finally, if we look down towards the bottom of the painting, we see that her left foot is resting on a rock. Could that be Plymouth Rock, it's indeed possible. So let's add up all of these symbols and references, and I think you would agree that this woman is a personification of the North. So now I can reveal to you the title of the painting. The title of the painting is an allegory of the North and the South. We have the three figures, and I think I might read to you uh, a statement made by Charles Sumner that might explain what the, he, the gist of the allegory is. And he said, An unholy union between the cotton planters and flesh monger, mongers of Louisiana and Mississippi and the cotton spinners and traffickers of New England, between the lords of the lash and the lords of the loom. I'd also uh, like to identify a little bit more who Charles Sumner was. He was the senator from Massachusetts, uh, and he was involved in a notorious horrific event. He was uh, caned, he was beaten up by in the Senate House in, on the floor of the Senate by Representative Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks was from no, no was from South Carolina, uh, and he was age 37 when this incident occurred. He was forced to resign, but as you might know, knowing South Carolinians, he was uh, soon after reelected. I'd like you to look at this painting in terms of how the painting is composed, how it comes together visually. And if you trace the drapery starting in the lower left of the painting, you'll see that it kind of flows and links the figures together. So the artist, Luther Terry, has managed to visually link this unholy union 
of the Lords of the Lash and Lords of the Loom. I'd like you to note something else, uh, and that is the physiognomy of the women. The South is dark-haired and dark-eyed, whereas the North has fairer hair and is actually blue-eyed. You may not be able to see this. This kind of physiognomy was, is, was very common in Italy, where Luther Terry was painting. You think of Southern Italians from the Mezzogiorno, they're dark-haired, dark-eyed, whereas uh, the Italians from the northern part of the country, uh, from a Milano, Turin, tend to be fair-haired. It just so happens at the time that Luther Terry was painting this painting in 1858, uh, Italians uh, across uh, various um, st uh, states uh, were uh, moving towards nationalism. There was a, a drive to unite the various states of Italy, whether it was the Duchy of, of Tuscany or Milan, the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily, or the Papal States. So the theme of unity, the allegory of the North and South, uh, is also represented here. So it's a kind of uh, dual representation. I've often wondered where Luther Terry uh, got his uh, visual sources. There he was in Rome. Uh, no doubt there were periodicals, newspapers, Harper's Weekly, Leslie Illustrated, maybe other uh, uh, newspapers from America um, that he would have had access to. I've often thought that maybe money um, would lend some of the visual sources. And so I did a little searching and you can see that several of these bills uh, have groups of female figures, uh, allegories presumably. I think uh, three of these have groups of women, some of which have the same kind of uh, visual tying together that we uh, saw a minute ago. Uh, uh, in the upper left, we have two women one of whom seems to um, have a cap of some sort. Sometimes they're single figures that might represent something like freedom of liberty. And here in the lower left, we have uh, black slaves, field hands working in the field. The thing here is, of course, this is Confederate money dated 1862, so this is not a $100 bill that Luther Terry could have possibly ever have seen. But that image uh, engraved on that um, currency is an image that probably appeared um, in other um, vehicles in, in the press. I've told you that Luther Terry was in Italy. I looked uh, endlessly for Italian sources that really would capture what um, he had done in an allegory of the North and South. Uh, Raphael comes to mind. This is a fresco uh, in the Vatican, and you can see it has some similarity, three women kind of visually tied together, um, but the subject doesn't really quite fit. The idea of allegory is often represented in Italian art, as it is here in the lower right-hand corner, uh, in a famous painting by Titian, the Venetian artist, called Sacred and Profane Love. And I'm not going to go into its iconography, but I will tell you uh, it's not what it appears, um, which is the sacred love and which is the profane love. So we have a lot of things going on in this painting, this allegory of the North and South. There are some mysteries uh, related to the painting. In addition to the sources, where did he get the ideas from? Uh, but more problematic is who he painted it for. Why did he paint it? Uh, I don't know of that many other paintings by him. I do know he painted Romeo and Juliet, and actually it was a painting that was purchased by Governor William Aiken, uh, a Southern uh, governor from Charleston. Uh, so he did have Southern patrons. 
It's entirely possible that he painted it either for a southern patron or a northern patron uh, who, after the Civil War, neglected to pick it up, pay for it, because the painting was still in Luther Terry's studio in the 1870s. So that's about it, except for one last thing, one last puzzlement, um, and we may want to discuss this. Why is America, Lady Liberty, extending her right hand in a gesture that almost looks like a blessing gesture? Is it a blessing gesture or is it a gesture that says, hold on, wait a minute, don't go pell-mell towards secession? So I'd love your ideas, I'd love your questions. So I'll let you, you see me back on screen. I'm gonna have a sip of water. Nancy, are there any questions in the chat? We do have some questions. Let's see. Um, some of them are just trying to see more about the painting. What is under the heel of the lady, the woman on the left side, the southern, the southerner? I think that white little piece of white. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of her drapery. She has an undergarment, um, and I think that's just part of her drapery. Okay. The, um, the woman in the middle seems to be holding a case with arrows. You talked about that earlier, but um, maybe mention that again. That's an ancient Roman symbol. If you look at it, it's, it's made up of several rods, round things that are lashed together, and then a, a, a kind of weapon-like thing on top. It's, a, it's called a facius, F-A-S-C-E-S, and it's a symbol of unity or authority. And I use the phrase e pluribus unum, out of many, one, which of course represents the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's under the book? It looks like a tree stump. Well, it is the tree stump. It's, ra it's rather an awkward detail. Um, so <laughs> just the, the roots of the old oak tree. Yeah. Um, Betty Jo wonders, why three women? Well, why not? <laughs> um, we, I mean, obviously, or, or I think we're used to the whole idea that America is a female figure. I mean, think of the late, of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, think of the statue that's on top of the Capitol building, which represents freedom. Uh, she's a woman. Um, for North and South, um, I don't know that there are as clear personifications but uh, I think it's only natural to have three women. Um, that's a good question though. You know, one question I had, and you talked about how the women, the um, woman from the South has a different look than the other two, but the, the other two to me look almost like the same model. Yes. Almost yeah, like they're I, sisters. And so does that mean that the one from the North is on the good team? You know. <laughs> Um, that's a very good question. Yes, um, the faces of uh, North and America are very similar in terms of their shapes. Uh, America's darker haired and got brown eyes. Uh, so that puts her, leans her towards the South a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, the next question, did you, you did not mention the over the North shoulder, the little town with the church. Is there any meaning to that? Well, I think it's a representation of, of a New England mill town. Um, uh, it's, it's small. Um, I'll give you a personal example. Um, my husband was born in Saxons River, Vermont, uh, population 600 when he was born. They had a woolen mill. His father actually worked in the woolen mill. Um, we're, we're talking about cotton here, but it, I think the idea is that there were mills um, all scattered all over the North. Uh, Lowell, Massachusetts is a famous uh, city uh, for having extensive uh, cotton textile mills. And that's all, that's before the Civil War, before the end of the 19th century, when the mills started to move down here and um, they also um, were electrified um, uh, by the end of the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. 
Um, then we just have a comment that the painting is very peaceful, but perhaps it wasn't that peaceful a time in reality. I think that's a good comment. We're, of course, we have historical retrospection, so we know what's happening on the horizon, that horizon line that um, uh, Lady Liberty and the North seem to be looking at. And one of the other, you know, the gaze of the South is towards us. Is she appealing to us? Is she, you know, hoping to win us over? You know, it's, it's ambiguous. Um, and then one question was, um, you know, the year this was created would denote the meaning of the extended arm. So of course this was painted pre-war. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. But things were happening. Yes. Rumblings, yes. Um, okay, here's a good question. Do you know whether Luther Terry had any feelings regarding slavery? Was it too early for him to be expressing abolitionist feelings in the central figure's extended right hand, perhaps condemning the conditions upon which the South was built? That is a good question. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about Luther Terry. We ha there are no papers uh, that I was ever able to discover I felt lucky to be able to find a photograph of him to, to show it show him to you. Um, being from Connecticut, uh, it's not out of the question that he would be uh, leaning towards abolition. Okay, there's lots of discussion here about the hand. Um, <laughs> someone said maybe the hand is a plea to calm down. <laughs> yes, I think so. I, I think that could be read that way. Yeah, and then someone else says it looks like America is looking off and attempting to halt something. Of course, that could be our hindsight, too. Right. Um, I think you answered this. Um, the artist was living in Italy when this was painted, correct? Yes, he was yeah. there. He, he was there for, had been there for almost 20 years. He uh, went there in his 20s uh, in 1839. Um. Another comment, the South is being seductive. Yes. <laughs> kind of hedonistic. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll give people just a minute more to if they have any last questions or comments they want to put in the chat. Um, well, well I'll, so raise, I'll raise a question. Why do you suppose I chose Vino Rosso? Well, I would assume because the artist was living in Italy, but maybe there's another reason. Very good, Nancy. Very good. <laughs> he would have drunk Vino Rosso for sure. Yeah. Um, and someone else is saying that he wouldn't have been aware of the rumblings of war, but I believe you said you talked about some of the American publications that would have been available to him in Italy. So he would have known and perhaps letters as well. To keep yeah. Him aware of letters. Of right. And um, I don't know this part of American history that well, but um, I think just before the painting was done, we had the Dred Scott um, decision uh, about slavery, about a you know, slave moving north and uh, you know, giving up his freedom, I mean, gaining freedom, but then moving back south and uh, being a slave again. So it was a very contested time and contested uh, moment. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more. Um, oh, well, here, why Rome? Was he a sculptor? Do you know why he chose Rome? Um, well, Rome was def definitely one of the Italian cities that uh, an uh, artist gravitated to, um, both uh, uh, English, French, and American, both, all three. And um, I, I think it was an opportunity. Well, this has been great, and um, we, we like for these to be 30 minutes, and gosh, Martha, you, you timed this down to the very, <laughs> you get a gold star for that. Um, so we are grateful for you providing this for us. This has been very interesting. I um, enjoyed taking the painting apart and thinking about all the pieces, and not just saying, wow, that's beautiful. Um, and I think everyone else did as well. I'm starting to see some thank yous, and, and this is fascinating in the um, comments. So thank you very much for doing this. And remember next week, we'll have Tom Strange um, with um, a musical instrument from the Siegel Museum here in Greenville. And we it's the same Zoom link as this week. And we hope we'll see you there. 
Um, many of you probably attended our town hall yesterday, but if you didn't, we announced that we are going to be able to return to some in-person classes in June and more in the fall with lots of restrictions, but still better than nothing. So we are looking forward to that. Um, thank you all for coming. Sarah Lindsay says that was almost as good as Martha in person. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and we hope to see you next week. Thank, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Hi, fun. Hi, Carol. Martha's up. Martha, you're always wonderful. Martha, every time you do something, I just learn wads. I love you. <laughs> oh, I have fun too. Oh, good. I, I've seen that painting hundreds of times and now I know more about it every time I look at it. Yay, good. That's the idea. Well, I'm glad you had fun too. We never want anything our Ollie instructors do to feel like a job or like work. So y'all retired from that. So I'm glad that it was enjoyable for you as well. Well, it was great to see everybody and I think we will close out and look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Salute. You.